Darwin, zooplankton behavior, and climate change. That's the topic of my talk today. Um, and there are two events, recent events, uh, which uh, I want to use as starting points for my talk today. Uh, one is COP15, uh, which is happening just down the road right now as we speak, um, which has focused the world's attention on climate change. And the other event, perhaps somewhat less evident, uh, was the 150 year anniversary of Darwin's public, uh, pub, uh, publication of the origin of the species. Um, and to connect those two, I want to take you on a tour to the deep oceans of the world, uh, where this little guy, a copepod, is a central actor in, the, uh, in regulating climate and whose behavior is attuned to Darwin's grand unifying theory of life. As a marine uh, scientist, I'm often confronted by the question like this, what will the world's oceans look like 100 years from now? And of course, this has two aspects. The first is the physical structure and circulation. That the oceans will invariably become warmer is evident, um, but how will that warming be distributed from time to time and from place to place? The oceans will also become somewhat fresher, stand maybe a little bit higher, um, become a little bit more acidic, uh, and large circulation patterns like the Gulf Stream and the North Atlantic Drift might slow, stop, or even reverse. And embedded in that, of course, is the question of what sort of life will the oceans support in the future? Will jellyfish become more um, uh, successful than fish? And will the living resources of the oceans be as, as abundant and as, uh, as uh, harvestable as they are today for the millions of people who rely on those things? Those are the sorts of questions that I wish to address. Now, the unsettling thing about climate change is that it's driving the world into a configuration that we have never seen before. What this means is that when we take measurements, they might reveal trends, but the ability of those measurements to make robust and reasonable predictions in the future is limited. In order to do that, we have to have some basic mechanistic understanding of what it is that, that uh, connects climate change to the biosphere. Um, and it is precisely that, that the biosphere is intimately connected with climate change. Uh, it is both a driver and susceptible to a changing world. That the oceans are actually an important or an integral part of climate change can be sort of seen from this figure. Um, the the uh, release of greenhouse gases from the, uh, from, from by human activity is going into the atmosphere. But if we look basically at the amount of carbon that is within the atmosphere compared to how much is in the deep ocean, there's 50 times more carbon in the deep ocean than there is in the atmosphere. With the implication being that should there be even a very small change and the mechanisms that drive carbon into the deep ocean or the ability of the deep oceans to store that carbon, any small change could have enormous consequences for the entire carbon cycle of, uh, of the world. Now, how does that carbon get into the world's oceans to start with? Uh, from time to time and from place to place all over the world, vast areas are colored by um, by small plant-like plankton, uh, pl plant plankton, uh, which blooms, uh, sucking in or drawing down enormous amounts of carbon dioxide from the oceans into their biomass. And if you simply look at it like this, there is the total amount of, bio of, of carbon that's sucked down into this living matter in the oceans is 130 gigatons per year. If you compare that to human emissions, the thing that is being debated so hotly now just down the road, that's only six gigatons per year. Evidently, the ability of the ocean to take up that carbon is enormous. And 
if we just take it from that point of view, you can actually work out that only 12 square kilometers of the Kattegat can potentially take up all of the carbon emissions for one coal-powered plant in Denmark, um, which would then solve all our problems, but only if that were true. The important question is not that the oceans draw down this carbon, it's what happens to it afterwards. A quick cartoon or a quick summary of exactly the processes that occur in, occur in the ocean. Carbon dioxide is in equilibrium with the atmosphere and the ocean, there's a free exchange. Uh, sunlight together with carbon dioxide is used by phytoplankton, these very small plant uh, plankton that are drifting, drifting around the surface of the ocean to, uh, to create their biomass. They convert it into organic carbon. Phytoplankton is eaten by zooplankton, zooplankton is eaten by fish, and the fish are caught by humans and consumed by us. If this was the only thing that was occurring in the ocean, it would be absolutely carbon neutral. Any carbon that goes in would come out again. But the process is not. And the important part of the entire process is this, the sinking out of carbon from this entire process into the deep ocean. <coughs> and this is where these guys, my little friends, the copepods, come in. They're crustaceans. Uh, they're typically about one to two millimeters in size. That's about the size of a, a, a grain of rice. Um, and they come in a whole variety of different forms. Some extremely flamboyant, as you can see here, uh, and some much more prosaic. <coughs> they're extremely widespread. They're found in all bodies of waters from lakes and ponds to rivers, estuaries, the coastal seas, and also the, the open ocean. And they're extremely abundant. As a class, they represent the largest biomass of living matter in the oceans. <coughs> and they also, per, they, their role uh, is also important in this entire process of bringing carbon down into the deep oceans. And this is a process known as the biological pump. Uh, zooplankton consume this, uh, these, these uh, plants like this, and how can I put it nicely, but they repackage what they don't use into small pellets, small uh, pellets but larger, that sink very rapidly and rain down into the deep ocean. Their other role is that they migrate vertically, and in migrating vertically, they spend quite a large part of the day at depth. And while they're down there, they respire. They breathe out carbon dioxide. And it's this process carrying carbon from the surface oceans all the way down into the deep ocean that is known as the biological pump. And copepods play an extremely important role in this process. Now, when you think about migration, you probably think about birds flying from north to south uh, in their winter migrations or wildebeest roaming across the, the savannas of Africa. But as it turns out, it is the vertical migration of zooplankton that is by far the largest concerted movement of biomass anywhere on Earth. And obviously this has a huge role in the budgets, the carbon budgets of the Earth. Now we come to the question, how will this migration alter as climate changes. In a future world, how will that migration change? And by implication, what will that affect, what will the effect be then on the biological pump and the ability of the oceans to take up and uh, carbon? In order to do that, to address that, we have to have a mechanistic understanding. And this is where Darwin comes in. The central concept of Dar Darwin's theorem uh, is fitness. It is a measure of how well an individual organism can survive and reproduce in face of all the adversities and, and uh, opportunities that nature can throw at it. This is the driving force of evolution and it is the driving force of the origin of species. But Fitness or Darwin's concept are not simply something that's locked away in the geological past. The echoes of evolution can be seen in how animals behave today. 
put in another way, all animals, all organisms are confronted by three overarching tasks. They have to find food, they have to reproduce, and they have to avoid being eaten themselves. Uh, invariably, um, finding food also exposes organisms to risk, to predation risk. In other words, fitness involves a trade-off. There's a trade-off between what, how an animal behaves in finding food, reproducing, or uh, avoiding um, predation. And there's actually a fairly simple um, uh, model that we can use to quantify that. Fitness is the difference between the benefit and the cost of a behavior divided by the risk. And as a slight aside, this is actually a fairly good model of, a, of the economic return of a small business as well. Um, and that's not surprising. So, now we can come to uh, understanding, a mechanistic understanding of why there is this dial, dial, daily migration of zooplankton. They have to feed in the surface, that's where the plants grow. But while they're up there in the light, they also expose themselves to predation risk. They had the option then of migrating to depth during the day uh, and coming up only at night to feed. So that is the basic trade-offs that they have. Uh, staying at depth during day, coming up at night to feed. But that also begs the question then, how can we predict this behavior? When should they start to go down? How deep should they go? How fast should they move up and down? And when should they start to come up? And that's where we can use Darwin's concept of fitness and try to calculate that and try to simulate that and make predictions about how that would be. And this is where I come to a simulation. This is a simulation of precisely that sort of event. All the little dots over here on, on this panel going up and down, those are simulations of copepods going up and down. Each one is an individual animal that has to try to maximize its fitness in the timing and the depth that it goes up and down. Up there, that's the sun going up, down. So it gives you an idea of the day-night cycle. And this is the amount of food that they have available to them to feed. And as they're going up and down, their fitness changes. Uh, and I use exactly the same process in doing this calculation as evolution uses in nature. I kill off those with the worst fitness and I let those with the best fitness, the highest fitness, reproduce. It's a genetic way of trying to calculate a certain process, trying to find the optimal behavior that these organisms have. And there they go up and down. They're sinking down to or swimming down to about 300 meters depth at the, during the day to avoid predation up to the surface at about uh, 20, 30 meters depth uh, during the night to feed. Uh, and they start up and down, they start down just after, um, yeah, they start down just after sunrise and they start up just before sunset. And from that, we can then start to estimate exactly how these organisms will respond, will adapt under climate change. So here we have it. The daily migration patterns of populations of copepods such as these emerges from a fitness-seeking behavior. And under climate change, we can expect that migration to change in accordance. Um, things like the clarity of water. Uh, should there be a, a catastrophic melting of, of the Greenland ice caps, it will deliver a huge amount of glacial silt into the oceans around Greenland, changing the clarity of the water, the penetration. Fish will not be as, as dangerous under those conditions as they are today. The plankton productivity could change. If that reduces, then the organisms will, cannot afford to go uh, spend so much time at depth, they will have to feed in the surface. And if the type of predator changes from fish, in this case, to jellyfish, again, they will be exposed to a certain amount of risk. And therefore, we can make these predictions about how this vertical migration will occur under climate change and the impact, of course, that it has on the pumping of carbon dioxide from the surface waters into the deep ocean. Now, 
what I've tried to illustrate here, uh, this migration of zooplankton, is only a small part of the entire puzzle. Uh, yet it serves to illustrate some very important and very general points. Um, the first is that Darwin's ideas, they provide predictive tools, tools that we sorely need at this time uh, when we're trying to predict what's going to happen in a fairly un uncertain future. Um, they tell us not just how life evolved, but how it will behave and who the winners will be in a future, uh, in, in, in a future climate. Um, it is precisely the extra information that we need to make robust and, uh, and uh, believable, credible models of how the oceans will adapt in the future um, and how life, the biosphere and climate will adapt as we are propelled into uh, an otherwise uncertain future. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>